The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Please remain standing. We're going to read Scripture. It's 2 Samuel 19, beginning in verse 40, and then all the way through chapter 20. So a long text today, 2 Samuel 19, 40. I'll just go straight through the chapter break to the end of chapter 20, which has itself 26 verses. Remember as I read and as you follow along that this is God's word. Now, the king went on to Gilgal, and Kimham went on with him, and all the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel accompanied the king. Behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why had our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? Then all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative to us. Why then are you angry about this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has anything been taken for us? But the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king. Therefore, we also have more claim on David than you. Why then did you treat us with contempt? Was it not our advice first to bring back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the words of the men of Israel. Now a worthless fellow happened to be there whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from following David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah remained steadfast to their king from the Jordan, even to Jerusalem. Then David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, the concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and placed them under guard and provided them with sustenance, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as widows. Then the king said to Amasa, Call out the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to call out the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which he had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do, more, do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, so that he does not find for himself fortified cities and escape from our sight. So Joab's men went out after him, along with the Carathites and the Pelathites and all the mighty men, and they went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the large stone, which is at Gibeon, in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them, Now Joab was dressed in his military attire, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened at his waist, and as he went forward, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard against the sword which is in Joab's hand, so he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground and did not strike him again, and he died." Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now there stood by him one of Joab's young men and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. But Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa from the highway into the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came by him stood still. As soon as he was removed from the highway... All the men passed on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, even Baith Maka, and all the Barites, and they were gathered together and also went, with, went after him. They came and besieged him in, a- in Abel, Baith Maka, and they set up a siege ramp against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab were wreaking destruction in order to topple the wall. Then a wise woman called from the city, Here, here, please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. So he approached her, and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then he said to him, Listen to the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. Then she spoke, saying, Formerly they used to say, They will surely ask advice at Abel. And thus they ended the dispute. I am of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You are seeking to destroy a city, even a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Joab replied, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. Such is not the case. 
But a man from the hill country of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has lifted up his hand against King David. Only hand him over, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman wisely came to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they were dispersed from the city, each to his tent. Joab also returned to the king at Jerusalem. Now Joab was over the whole army of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and the Pelathites, and Adoram was over the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder, and Shiva was scribe, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Ira the Jerite was also a priest to David. Well, let's pray once more. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for this record of your acts among your people. We pray that we would learn from it. Give us open ears and may your spirit use your word in our midst this morning. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This chapter, 2 Samuel 20, marks the chronological end of the Davidic decline that we've been looking at this semester. There are chapters, of course, in 2 Samuel after chapter 20, and some commentators have characterized these chapters in different ways, but at the very least, it appears that these chapters act as a kind of coda to chapter 20. They revisit events that may have happened earlier in David's reign and, and bring about some important theological conclusions. So they're, they're significant, they're organized, they're orderly, they're, they're precisely where the Lord wanted them to be, these accounts in chapters 21 and following. But, but they don't follow chronologically, strictly speaking, from what we see here in this chapter. So in a sense, chronologically speaking, this is, this is the end of this Davidic decline that we've been looking at. Now, the, the, the chapter itself has all these confusing twists and turns. In fact, I think perhaps the, the best way we could describe the events of this chapter, uh, and beginning back actually in verse 40 of chapter 19, is that, is that they're filled with what we might call collateral damage. You know this expression, collateral damage, it's used in military endeavors when there's a certain objective that needs to be taken care of, but in the midst of taking care of that objective, perhaps a, a building that needs to be blown up or something like this, in the midst of that, uh, there's this concern that while we may hit the target, we may also do damage to all kinds of people around the target who are not actually the intended target. In fact, that military term, of course, is, is so well known to us that now we use it for all kinds of things. We, we, we talk about collateral damage in relationships. We talk about collateral damage in government policies and, and all kinds of things. But here we see one act of collateral damage after another as David returns to his throne. And the first thing we see, of course, is that David is returning. You remember in verse 39, the people cross over the Jordan with David. He's, he's brought the men of Judah with him, and he's blessed this man who followed him so closely. But immediately after that, after he crosses over the Jordan, as is recorded for us in verse 39, there is this, uh, this damage, this division that we see immediately beginning in verses 41 through 43. You know, of course, what happens in these verses because we just read them. Israel, the men of Israel, the ten northern tribes, uh, actually accuse the men of Judah uh, of stealing David from them. And then Judah argues back that they have a prior relationship to David. They have a closer connection to David in verse 42, because after all, David is from their tribe. And, and, then, and then Judah further argues that David hasn't actually given them anything. They haven't benefited from this. They're not, they're not, they're not getting some kind of preferential treatment as a tribe. And after all, they have every right to have David with them. Israel then argues back in verse 43, saying that they are larger, there are more tribes of Israel than there are of Judah, so they should have a greater share of David and his restored kingdom. They also argue that they were the first, actually, to ask for David to return 
And, and, and what we see in the end is that Judah ultimately wins the argument, but not because necessarily of the strength of their case or for any reasons related to the scriptures or what the Bible says about David reigning in Jerusalem, but rather it says they won because they were harsher. They, they in a sense, had the better comeback than the men of Israel. This immediately leads, of course, to the next a uh, surprising act of, we might say, collateral damage as David returns to the throne. And that's this whole incident with this man named Sheba. Now, the, the text is interesting in the way in which it refers to Sheba in chapter 20, verse 1. It calls him a, a worthless fellow. This is a phrase that we see used throughout Judges from time to time and other places as well in the historical books. These are generally people who have no real concern for the things of the Lord and who are really uh, coming on the scene simply to stir up trouble. Uh, that's who Sheba is. Sheba is, is an antagonist of David and he's an antagonist really of the Lord and of the Lord's people. And so the text refers to him in this way as this worthless fellow. But he incites a rebellion against David. It's interesting the way in which the rebellion uh, is kicked off in verse 1. He blows a trumpet and then he says this. It's a little poetic phrase that he appeared to yell. We have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the sons of Jesse. Now, it's especially striking that this is his slogan, that this is his campaign uh, sticker, so to speak. Uh, because actually, in chapter 19, the men of Israel were saying the exact opposite. Uh, they were saying, we should have ten shares in David. And now here comes <laughs> this worthless man, Sheba, and he's saying, we have no share in David. That David has left us behind. He's with the Judahites, and, and we men of Israel need to band together against David. And so he ends with, every man to his tents, O Israel. It's really an act of war that he's inciting against David. And the men of Israel, it says, followed him, uh, beginning in verse 2 and then further on. They followed him, but the men of Judah stood fast, it says, uh, from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So immediately after David's ascent to the throne, immediately after the Lord has rescued David, and David has rewarded those around him, and David has begun to reassemble a kind of cabinet for himself, immediately after that, there's this division in the land. Uh, the, the kingdom is, is no longer united. In fact, they're at odds with one another, and they're against David. And the proximate cause is this man Sheba, but of course it's deeper than that. The, the rift runs deeper, and we know that already from chapter 19. It's no surprise after David's death that very soon we see two generations later the kingdom divide completely and, and never to be put back together until this promised Messiah arrives. But in any case, we see that happening here at the end of David's reign. Imagine, imagine this, at, at David's moment of seeming, seemingly greatest triumph, where he's finally, finally back where he's supposed to be. And God has rescued him and perhaps put all this judgment behind him. The sword shall not depart from your house. Perhaps David thought that that was now over with, with Absalom's death. At that moment where he seems to be, uh, his fortune seemed to have turned, the Lord seems to have blessed him, uh, this division takes place. It's, a real, it's really a tragic end to the account of David. So what does David do? Well, David's response to this is quite simply a military response. David asks Amasa to, in verse 4, to go after Sheba, to gather some men. He gives him three days to do it, gather some men together, and go after him and, and, and take down this rebellion. It's striking that he, he chooses Amasa to do this. Because, of course, Amasa had been Absalom's commander. He had been David's sworn enemy just a chapter or two before. And you remember when David ascends to the throne again, when David is restored after Absalom's death, rather than elevating Joab to be his, his second in command and commander of his armies, instead he leans on Amasa. We don't know exactly the psychology behind this. Perhaps David thought this was a clever move to unite 
previous enemies together under his reign. Perhaps it had something to do with Joab's confrontation of David. You'll remember when, when David was mourning the death of his son Absalom and perhaps mourning in a way that, that, that lost sight of his duties to his people. Joab was the one who confronted him and gave him a hard truth. And perhaps that was weighing on David's mind. We don't know the psychology, but we know that David again and again is leaning on Amasa, and he does that here. He sends Amasa, tells him to call out the men of Judah within three days. And so Amasa went out, but it took longer than he had planned for it to take. It took longer than these three days. And David, being impatient, then turns to Abishai next and Abishai and says to Abishai that this could be a greater crisis even than the Absalom crisis. And so he puts Abishai in charge instead of Amasa to take out this worthless fellow uh, Sheba. Now, this leads to another string of events, uh, another uh, series of what we might call evidences of collateral damage. Because in turning to Abishai, what David's really doing ultimately is he's turning to Joab. And he's, he's essentially giving it over to Joab's family, although he doesn't say so. But it's Joab's men in verse 7 who go out after this worthless fellow, Sheba. Now, Joab, along the way, encounters Amasa, who had been sent out initially by David. And what Joab does when he encounters Amasa is it appears in a kind of act of subterfuge, he essentially assassinates Amasa on the road. His sword falls out of his hand. It's it's not exactly clear he's going in to embrace Amasa. Amasa doesn't quite see the threat, and Joab ends up stabbing him in, verse, in verses 9 and 10. It says, Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard against the sword which was in Joab's hand, so he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground. Maybe Amasa should have been reading Judges that morning and should have read the story of Eglon because it's almost exactly the same language that's used here and it's almost exactly the same strategy that's used here. Joab uh, does an Eglon on Amasa and, and kills him uh, while he's least uh, expecting it. So now uh, this, this murder is attracting attention And so uh, Amasa's body is in the middle of the road, and ultimately the men aren't sure exactly what to do. So finally his body gets thrown off the road, and it's covered up so that that no one will be uh, distracted by it. And that leads to the next episode in this strange chapter at the end of David's uh, time as king. And this strange chapter, or this this strange episode, switches to a town in Israel uh, called Abel. And we don't know a great deal about it beyond what we find here, but it appears that Sheba was, was hiding in this village in Abel. It must have been a stronghold for the men of Israel. And finally, he's tracked down uh, by Joab, and they reach Abel. They know that Sheba is there. And we see uh, this this, uh, threat against Abel. Joab and his men are are trying to take down the walls of the city to break in and to take Sheba as perhaps a hostage or more likely maybe just to kill him in a very public way. But out comes this wise woman from the city in verse 16. A wise woman, it says, called from the city. Hear, hear, please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. Now, this is an interesting woman who comes out and speaks with Joab. She seems to understand the political implications of the whole situation. She seems to certainly understand the military implications of the whole situation. It's very interesting because later on when Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes, he talks about a wise man who, who, could, who could, through his wisdom, save a city and yet he might be uh, forgotten soon after. And Solomon goes on to opine about how wisdom actually was more valuable, was more of an asset, even in military matters, than than great strength. And and we see that played out at some level here with this wise woman of Abel. She comes out, she calls to Joab, 
And she, she, and Joab makes it very clear that he doesn't want to destroy the city. That's not really his intention. She, she makes her case for the city. And, and Joab indicates that's not really what he's after. What he's really after is Sheba. And so the woman, it says, and the text tells us she said this, she was very wise when she said this. She, she convinces the people of the city to, to kill Sheba and to, and to throw his head over the wall so that Joab knows for sure that he uh, has been killed. And you see this in verse 22. The woman wisely came to all the people and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. And just as the chapter began with the blowing of a trumpet for an insurrection, it ends with the blowing of a trumpet. Only this time it's not Sheba who's blowing the trumpet. His head is lying lifeless on the ground. It's Joab who's blowing the trumpet and he's dispersing all the people because the rebellion has been quashed and the war is over. And there's this interesting little epilogue in these last three verses where it talks about the outcome of all of this, all of these strange, unexplic inexplicable actions, the end of the reign. How does it end? Well, it ends with Joab being over the whole army of Israel. That's verse 23. But it ends with a kind of division of the people. It says, Joab was over the whole army of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and the Pelethites. It's not really the whole army of Israel. It's, it's most of the army of Israel, but there are a few exceptions. Apart from that, it's the whole army. And then we see that not only is there this kind of uh, division, perhaps, within the army, with Joab in the point of highest command, we also see in verse 24 that the nation itself is partially enslaved. That's what verse 24 tells us. Adoram was over the forced labor. Where did the forced labor come from? Well, apparently, that was one of the outcomes, as it often is, of this military campaign that Joab ultimately went on. And then we find in verse 26 something perhaps even worse after it describes who the scribe was and describes the priests. Verse 26 has this very strange note to end this episode of David's life. Ira the Jerite was also a priest to David. So after all of this, after this somewhat successful campaign, Although David didn't design it to work out this way, Joab ultimately carried out this successful campaign against the rebellion. After this somewhat successful campaign, what are we left with? Well, we're left with Joab, this, uh, perhaps this, you could say this murderer in charge, certainly not David's first choice, but he's in, in command. You're left with a partially divided army. You're left with people who are partially enslaved. And you're left with David having his own private religion. Because you'll notice that in verse 26, Ira, whom David appoints as his own personal private priest, is not uh, of the priestly line that, that David was supposed to have chosen from. There's no, there's no place here in the scriptures for David the king to have his own personal priest in the way that he does in verse 26. So you really come to the end of this whole section. And on the one hand... This Davidic decline has been reversed. David is back in power. Absalom is dead. This last rebellion that we're introduced to has been taken care of, and the army is more or less intact. But you say to yourself, is this really the Davidic kingdom? This is the end of the Davidic kingdom? And that's the real question, I think, that chapter 20 leaves us with. If this is the restored Davidic kingdom. Well, something seems to be wrong. It's not restored in terms of the law with respect to worship. It's not really restored with respect to the unity of the people. Uh, the right people are, are compromised terribly uh, by their actions. Even those who are in charge uh, perhaps don't deserve to be in charge. Now, if this is the restored Davidic kingdom that we get at the end of the book, something surely is missing. There's victory, but there is severe compromise, and at every turn, there seems to be collateral damage, even from the good decisions. And then we have all these decisions that perhaps we could question. 
But even take the wise woman. She, she does a wise thing, the text tells us, and she is a wise woman. But oh, what was the cost of that wisdom? Well, they had to kill this man and throw his head over the wall. This, this chapter, I think, as clearly as any that we've seen, gives us a, a, a picture of, of compromise and sin within even this restored Davidic kingdom. The kingdom. This is a kingdom that is given success by the Lord, and yet it's, it's filled with compromise. This, this in and of itself ought to be a reminder to us of the pernicious nature of sin in, in, in the lives even of God's people, and even, even in the lives of, of organizations, the Vedic kingdom, that are devoted ostensibly to, to the things of God. There's a kind of realism to it, isn't there? Even the good guys and the good woman who's here are, are, are compromised in ways that are certainly uncomfortable to us and should be uncomfortable to us when we compare them to the ideal that we have in Deuteronomy. The writer of 2 Samuel never stops and gives us a definition of total depravity as we get in other texts of Scripture. He never stops and, and tells us about it, but he does show it to us in so many ways. He shows us the, the pervasive effects of sin. He, he shows us the lives of people who none of whom have really escaped the corrupting influence of sin. You can go down the list of characters in this chapter, and you'll find some who are better than others, of course, some who are more wise and more foolish, some whose actions seem more justifiable. Perhaps you think Joab's actions were justified. Perhaps you think David's actions in, in, in putting his concubines aside were, were, were justified. And that may be true, uh, but the reality is there is still this deep compromise at the heart of all of None of it is exactly the way it should be. And I think this is something that's important to note about the Bible's view of, of human beings. There is a kind of realism here. There is an understanding, a, a, a clear portrayal of the effects of sin and depravity. The Bible doesn't really exempt anyone in, in this episode. Uh, from the effects of all of that. There's nothing perfect in this story. There's no, there's no utopian society. There's no utopian kingdom that David ushers in at the end of chapter 20. It does, I think, remind us of these places where we do get clarity on this doctrine. Uh, Paul, of course, says, No one is righteous, and no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. And this is the kind of thing we've seen played out over and over. And how different this is from the kingly rule of God that we have described for us, from the kingly rule of Christ that we have described for us again and again in the Scriptures. Our confession has excellent language on this, of course. It talks about the, the, the rule of God, the providence of God over His people. How different this is than David with all this collateral damage, blood being spilled everywhere. What does the confession tell us? God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least, by His most wise and holy providence, according to His infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of His own will, to the praise of the glory of His wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. David must have gotten to the end of this chapter, and if he was honest with himself, realized that none of that could be said of his own rule and his own decisions. But, but the contrast is so striking. And the contrast, not just between the collateral damage caused by all these decisions and, and the, the perfect and wise and holy and righteous providential rule of our God, but also we, we see the contrast between the kingdom as, as, as it's portrayed for us here in 2 Samuel 20 and, and the kingdom that we're, we're told to expect if, we, if we're reading First and 2 Samuel with those things in mind. Listen to how the Bible describes this king to come. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, 
my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. Well, that's the picture we get of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's certainly not the picture we get of this Davidic kingdom in 2 Samuel 20. No, the kingdom that we're looking for, the kingdom that this text ultimately points us toward, is a very different kind of kingdom. It's a kingdom with, with a wise and sovereign ruler. It's a kingdom ruled by the servant in whom God the Father delights. It's a kingdom ruled by the one who says, I will not break a bruised reed or a burn and a burning wick I will not snuff out. It's a kingdom made up of people who are indwelt and led by God the Holy Spirit and who are seeking the glory of God and are governed by His Word and are confident in His ultimate victory and justice. It's not fueled by the kind of selfish ambition and, and, and lack of wisdom that we see portrayed for us here, but no, it's fueled by, by, by an understanding of God's Word and looking for, for the fruit of the Spirit to, to be borne out in us. I think when we get to the end of this Davidic decline, we can say the Lord was faithful in all of His promises to David. That much is clear. And the Lord did rescue David. That much is clear as well. David, David is alive and Absalom is dead. Uh, David is alive and his enemy Sheba has been killed as well. Uh, and, yet, and yet we can't help but come to the end of this Davidic decline, not just with a greater appreciation of the depth of human sin, depravity, compromise, uh, but also with a greater appreciation uh, for the kingdom that we see portrayed for us in the pages of Scripture, the kingdom promised to David. We don't see in David's reign, but we do see in the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ among His people, even now breaking in. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we do thank You for this Word, for Your instruction to us, and for the record of Your people. We pray that You would cause us to learn the lessons that we are to learn from these texts, that we would meditate on them. They're difficult for us. Uh, they, they, in some ways, go against our expectations. And yet, Lord, we pray that by Your Spirit, You would confirm these truths in our heart. Teach us to love You and to seek first Your kingdom and Your righteousness. We ask that Your kingdom would come in all of its fullness, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.